Hey everyone, Three Sons Restorations here with a two-part video series featuring my setup of the Industrial Air 60-gallon compressor and shop airlines. In my shop, this compressor is used to power both a sandblasting cabinet and a powder coating system, as well as run various other handheld tools. The Industrial Air Compressor, which is assembled by Matt Industries, is just one of multiple varieties that share the same compressor parts on top. Other brands with this motor, but with a different paint scheme and tank shape, include Powermate, Porter Cable, and DeWalt. In this first video, I'll be walking you through the way I chose to power this compressor, how I've attempted to reduce some of the noise it makes, and how I put together the plumbing next to the unit. In the next video, part two, I'll be walking you through how I dry compressed air in my homemade air dryer. Let's get started. My setup came with five goals. The first is to keep sharp angles to a minimum with as few 90 degree turns as possible. A 90 degree angle can cause as much as five PSI loss in the system due to turbulent airflow. In my system, there are only two 90 degree turns. The second goal is to maximize airflow by keeping as many fittings as possible at least half inch inner diameter and to make sure that all of the quick connects are full flow. The third goal is to reduce moisture in the lines. I accomplish this with my homemade air dryer. The fourth goal is to eliminate obstructions and debris such as oil and dirt and to do so in the right places with strategically placed filters. The fifth and final goal is to reduce noise and vibration, since I live in a suburb with other houses close by. The very first thing I did after removing the compressor from its two shipping pallets was to install these anti-vibration pads under each of the three feet. I made sure to level the feet of the compressor so that it wasn't leaning with the slope of my floor. Next, it was time to power the unit. The Industrial Air 3.7 horsepower motor requires 240 volts and draws around 16 to 17 peak amps, so I had an electrician wire in a 30 amp dedicated circuit for me. I felt it was better to go bigger rather than barely cover the peak draw of the motor with just a 20 amp circuit. The wiring for the compressor, which I'll get to in a minute, requires two hot wires and a ground, so the plug style I chose was a NEMA 6-30 as I already had two hot wires and a ground wire in my junction box. This compressor does not come with a supplied power cord, so I purchased an 8 foot long NEMA 6-30 to ROJ 30 amp power cord with 10 gauge wiring. To wire the compressor, first you'll thread your cord through this hole in the compressor to support it. To wire the cord in, you'll unscrew the cover to the switch, thread your cord through the strain relief, then connect your three wires using the appropriate wire connectors and a crimping tool. My compressor came with wire connectors for the hot wires, but I had to purchase a ring wire connector for the ground wire. The manufacturer leaves an empty screw for your ground wire. Next, after checking the oil level and running the compressor for 30 minutes to break it in, I took off the petcock that came installed with the compressor and installed an extended tank drain assembly, which allows for much easier access to draining water from the tank. I highly recommend one of these kits. I feel it encourages one to perform the necessary draining schedule these compressors need. Next, it was time to install some air fittings. My compressor's air outlet size is 3 quarter inch, but it's my understanding that various iterations of this same compressor can come with smaller outlet sizes, so you might want to check on that before you purchase one. I started by locating a ball valve with a male end to eliminate the need for a fitting right off of the compressor that can leak. The goal is to have an absolute stop right after the compressor's air outlet. Having a full port valve also ensures that there is no restriction coming right out of the tank. Next, I put in a 90 degree elbow so that I could angle my whip hose back to the wall and run it behind the compressor. I bought a 3 quarter inch whip hose primarily to cut down on any vibration from the compressor which could be transferred to the wall and increase the noise. Unlike many of the whip hoses on the market, this one also has no restrictions inside at the ends, and that's because it's actually a hydraulic hose. Hydraulic hoses are a bit heavier and stiffer than traditional whip hoses, and so can tolerate more stresses. The only drawback to hydraulic hoses is that they don't come with a swivel on one of the ends for easy connection. So that's why I installed a 3 quarter inch union at one of the ends of it. 
The unions can be prone to leaking, so I'd recommend a bit of grease on the threads in addition to some Rector Seal pipe dope. Before I get to the first hardline assembly, I do want to point out that at present time I have chosen not to install long copper lines to cool and dry the air for my supply. I live in a low humidity area and don't need a ton of air with each use. I haven't yet needed further moisture reduction past my present setup. However, if that changes at some point, I'll use the space behind the compressor to zigzag 25-ish feet of copper line to, for cooling purposes. In the meantime, this space is occupied by some 12 by 12 acoustic panels for noise reduction. These panels are extremely light, absorb some of the sound vibrations, and are simply held up by some command strips. Now let's get on to the first assembly. All of my fittings were purchased at one of the big box stores, and I've stickied the list for them in the comments. To connect them, I used a combination of four to five turns of yellow Teflon tape, as well as Rector Seal pipe dope on top of that. The yellow Teflon tape is a bit thicker than the flimsy white stuff you see used everywhere. The chief concern of black pipe is rust, but as long as moisture is drained from the lines, this shouldn't be too big of a problem for me. From the 3 quarter inch union, I put in a T to allow for moisture collection at the bottom of an 8 inch nipple. You'll see a quarter turn ball valve at the end of this line. In the event I do end up running copper hard lines, I install this as a moisture gathering spot before air hits the regulator. Next, I separated various sections of my line with 3 inch pipe nipples. The regulator comes next, and is a well reviewed model made by Ingersoll Rand. You'll notice I didn't put up a filter here, and there's a reason for that. If you put your filter too close to the compressor, it won't do a very efficient job of collecting moisture, because the air coming through it can be too hot. The water vapor will simply blow right past through the filter, before condensing later on in your lines once it has a chance to cool. After the regulator comes another 3 inch nipple, and then a female to female coupler, before ending this section with a Milton G style coupler. I highly recommend these quick connect couplers. They allow you to stay at half inch diameter and are extremely high flow couplers, allowing 99 cubic feet per minute of airflow. A fellow YouTuber did a good summary on these couplers, so I'll put a link to his video down in the description. You'll be amazed at the difference in airflow you can get with these couplers as compared to traditional ones. The reason I ended this first section with a Milton coupler is so that I can either attach my 50 foot half inch air hose right here and use it to pump up tires or with my brad nailer or any other random shop tool, or I can connect through my homemade air dryer to the next hardline assembly which feeds air to my sandblasting cabinet and powder coating setup. If you'd like to see the thoughts behind in the construction of my air dryer, click on the link above for that video. Assuming that I'm taking air down to the next piping section, I'll quick connect the air dryer unit to both the first and second wall mounted assemblies. Air will travel down through the cooler, allowing condensation to collect at the bottom, and then back up to what I'm calling the dryer assembly behind my sandblasting cabinet and powder coating station. In the event that there's a problem with the air dryer, or I want to bypass it, I can simply quick connect the green air hose between each wall assembly. On the second wall assembly, there's a drip line on a T right after the Milton Quick Connect, just before we hit the filters. The first filter is a 150 psi half inch unit made by Ingersoll Rand, and is designed to pick up any water that somehow made it past my air cooler and condensed. Following this is a second Ingersoll Rand regulator, which when used in sequence with my first regulator is termed a step down regulator. The idea is to allow a lot of air through the first regulator, say 100 psi, then turn down the pressures at the second regulator to what's needed at the tool, say 40 to 50 psi. This ensures that a lot of air remains available and isn't restricted early on in the lines, while still giving me flexibility to just use the first regulator if I'm filling up tires or whatnot. Following the step down regulator is a MotorGuard M60 air filter the second air filter in this assembly. The motor guard is best used as a point of use filter installed at the very end of the air lines to catch any remaining moisture right before the tool you're using. Following my air dryer and my first air filter, this second air filter is the last defense against any water remaining in my lines. From the motor guard, you'll see my air lines terminate in two point of use connections, one for my sandblasting cabinets and one that's usually used for painting. 
I can choose which line gets air and which doesn't, and you'll see that for each of these quick connects, I've dropped from a half inch down to one quarter inch. Milton again has a very quality quick connect system for doing so, called the V-Style High Flow Couplers. To these couplers are attached a couple of 3 8 inch air hoses, one of which is 6 feet long for my blasting cabinet, and one of which is 10 feet long for my painting station. This concludes the first video detailing my compressor and airline setup. Please be sure to check out part 2 in this video series to learn more about my homemade air dryer. Feel free to ask any questions in the comments below and I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. Thanks for watching!